Hello and welcome to the 24th annual Get Lit Festival. I'm Kate Peterson, director of Get Lit Programs, a nonprofit organization housed within Eastern Washington University. Our program is responsible for Get Lit, Washington State's longest running annual literary festival, which hosts readings, writing workshops, craft classes, panel discussions, and much more. This year, we're excited to be hosting in-person events taking place this Thursday through Sunday, April 21st through 24th, in many venues across downtown Spokane. And of course, we're very happy to be back with you in this virtual space as well. You can find a full schedule of in-person and virtual events along with information about all of our festival authors by visiting our website, getlitfestival.org. Now I'd like to introduce GetLit's Assistant Coordinator, Luke Leinberger, who will tell us more about today's event. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Today we welcome Alda P. Dobbs, Daniel Ailman, Pyle Doshi, Margarita Longoria, and Maria Andrew for amplifying voices and visions border and immigrant perspectives in children's literature. They will discuss their shared goals of expanding and enriching young readers' views of the world and of themselves while creating empathy and showing how similar we all are in spite of our origins, histories, and cultural backgrounds. The writers will also share ideas for incorporating these books into lessons on teaching immigration, life near the US-Mexico border, and cultures outside the US. Before we hand it over to Alda, who will be moderating today's conversation, Kate and I would like to introduce you to the writers. Margarita Longoria is an award-winning high school librarian in South Texas. She is the founder of Border Book Bash, celebrating teens and tweens of the Rio Grande Valley and served on state reading committees for the Texas Library Association. She is the editor of Living Beyond Borders, Growing Up Mexican in America, which is a hopeful love letter from the Mexican American community to today's young readers. She grew up in Edinburgh, Texas, and lives with her family in the Rio Grande Valley. Maria E. Andrew is the author of Love in English, an indie next pick and Junior Library Guild Gold Standard selection, as well as an as, as yet untitled book. Her work has appeared in Literary Hub, Teen Vogue, and more. Her debut young adult novel, The Secret Side of Empty, is an International Latino Book Awards finalist, among other awards. Maria is Latinx and Argentinian-American and currently lives in New Jersey. Her work has been informed by her experiences as a formerly undocumented non-native English speaker and immigrant to the U.S. Pyle Doshi has lived in the U.K. and U.S., where she noticed a lack of Indian protagonists in global children's fiction and one day wrote the opening paragraph to what would become her first children's novel. She was born and raised in Mumbai, India, and currently resides in Minneapolis, Minnesota, with her husband and two-year-old daughter. Rhea and the Blood of the Nectar, the first book in the Chronicles of Enstranthia series, is her debut middle grade novel. Daniel Aylman was born and raised in Mexico City. A graduate of McGill University, he is passionate about books, coffee, and dogs. After spending time in Montreal and the New York City area, he now lives in Toronto, where he is on the never-ending search for the best tacos in the city. He is the author of Indivisible, his debut young adult novel, available now from Little Brown Books for Young Readers. Alda P. Dobbs is the author of the new novel, Barefoot Dreams of Petra Luna. She was born in a small town in Northern Mexico, but moved to San Antonio, Texas as a child. Alda studied physics and worked as an engineer before pursuing her love of storytelling. She's as passionate about connecting children to their past, their communities, different cultures and nature as she is about writing. Alda lives with her husband and two children outside Houston, Texas. Thank you for moderating today's conversation, Alda. We'll now hand it over to you. Thank you, Luke. I, I love that introduction. Thank you so much. And Kate, thank you for having us here. And Brittany, thank you for helping out. And we're going to get started. I, I love these authors that I'm having a panel here with. We've done several panels and they're just phenomenal. And I'm just so honored to be uh, friends with all the four of them. So we're going to get started and let you know our perspectives as immigrants and as uh, people coming into this country with different cultural backgrounds and living with different cultural backgrounds. And we're going to try to explain our views and our writings and how we feel that our books could impact young readers. So we're going to get started. I'm going to start with Margie. And I like Margie because she's a librarian. And oh my goodness, I, I get a lot of insights from Margie. So Margie, we're going to get started with you. How is the immigrant experience different across generations? And how can educators and librarians support kids with all different immigrant experiences? 
about, <clears throat> I used to be, once upon a time, I used to be an English teacher too. So we, I used to have a group of kids that they used to call, oh, they were the newcomers. And I remember when we, they first trained us to be the, they called it the sheltered instruction program, to, to be the teachers of these kids that were the newcomers to our, our country. The, the lady walks in to start the presentation and she's speaking in Korean. Right. And we're all looking at each other like, okay. And then she, you know, she didn't speak Spanish to us because she knows most of us would have understood Spanish, but Korean kind of threw us all off. And she was like, this is how your students feel when you come in and just start speaking to them in English. And I remember that made a big impact on me as a first year teacher, because I was like, you don't, it's not that you, a lot of times, and this is why we need to to help our educators understand. A lot of times we don't go in thinking like to hurt anybody or thinking that we're doing something wrong. You know, we're taught something in school and we go in to do it until somebody let, like shows you and tells you like, this is what th your kids are gonna be feeling. When she did that, when she like introduced herself like that to us, we, we kind of, you know, understood like these poor kids come into this country, they're scared. Their parents are scared. A lot of times, their parents won't come to the school or won't come ask us anything because they're not here legally or because they're scared, you know, and they don't know, they don't know the language. So it's our job as educators to make these kids feel comfortable, to make these kids understand that we, you know, because we're there to serve them as they're our students and we're there to serve them and to teach them and to help them assimilate into our educational system. And a lot of times, it's, we have to get down to their level, try, you know, we, we can use pictures, we can use cognates, we can use, and then me, I was lucky because I'm in an area where the kids speak Spanish and I can speak Spanish. So I was able to speak to them and we were able to get along and we were able to help them feel more comfortable in the classroom. It's very important for librarians to understand that not everybody is going to be just like you. Like you need to have, your library needs to be full of books that are diverse from every culture, not just from your culture, you know? And so, or from your, it has to be, I mean, it needs to be colorful. As colorful as your school is, as colorful as your classroom is, is how your shelves need to be. And that's very important, I think, that we need to do better in libraries and in schools and then curriculum with books, with diverse books and to be more, we need to be more em empathetic to other people's, the plight of other people, other people's cultures and just not so on like, well, this is what the curriculum says. I, I was just never one of those teachers that was like, this is what the curriculum says. I was very lucky that I worked in a school with a, with a principal who was just like, she would just close my door and just be like, you do what you need to do. To get to get where we need to be and and we always did so that's where we need to be as educators i think more open-minded yeah that i like that because uh i struggled a lot when i came to this country trying to learn english uh, like i mentioned before it took me about three four years to learn it and that's because everything in my neighborhood was in spanish uh, my family spoke in spanish my neighbors so it was a challenge for me to learn it and um i went through a lot learning it and I thought it was because I had gone to, through school in the in the 80s, 70s, 80s. So I figured, okay, it's different now. You know, things have changed. But just a couple of days ago, I was at the library and um, I overheard two parents speaking to a librarian that uh, they had just moved from Mexico and their 12-year-old child, uh, she was struggling. And she, they said she was a perfect student back in, in Mexico, had straight A's. But now she was having panic attacks. Her grades were dropping. She didn't want to read anymore. And she was always, you know, loved reading and whatnot. But it's just that culture shock. And, and I said, oh, my goodness, you know, this is 40 years after my experience. And it's still happening. You know, kids are still facing the, that, uh, <clears throat> that panic attacks and the insecurities and the lack of confidence that they, they don't have that guidance. So, you know, I... I couldn't help it, but I said, hey, you know, this is who I am, you know, please, you know, if I could help in any way, but, but just to see that people are still struggling with kids and it just breaks my heart because I went through that and I'm thinking that things have changed and have progressed, but like you said, Margie, things, you know, we still have ways to go 
So that I like that, that you mentioned that. And also because of your book, the anthology. So you have all these perspectives of people and what their experiences were coming to America and growing up Mexican in, in America. So that's that's wonderful. And I'm going to go to Payal because Payal, you, you migrated to the U.S. So, but your experience was different because you said you spoke English already, but but the, the culture was was different. So what was your experience and how does that reflect, you know, to this question about uh, librarians and educators, how could they support kids, you know, that are, that are immigrants? Yeah, absolutely. So I, well, you know, uh, born and raised in Mumbai, I moved to the US for my master's when I was 27 years old. Um, and so I was, you know, I'm still Indian. Um, and because of, you know, colonization, uh, with the Brits uh, colonizing India, we have, you know, a lot of our schooling is in English already from kindergarten upwards. Of course, there are regional languages schools as well. But most of us who come from the cities speak English. Just growing up, we, we speak English, we, you know, our schooling is in English. So for me personally, English was not an issue at all, but that's not the case for uh, you know, several Indians that come from the smaller villages and towns. Um, however, however, English is still spoken quite widely for them to have some sort of a grasp. But what I ended up doing with my book, uh, which is Rian, the Blood of the Nectar, I wanted to show uh, you know, this side of A, that there are cultures outside of the US and also that for kids who live in the US, much like what you said in terms of language, um, there are kids, like my cousins, uh, born and raised in New Jersey, uh, were raised to not speak our native language at home, because if the accent, so the Indian accent sort of came into their accent, they didn't want, the, their, my aunt and uncle didn't want the kids to get bullied, uh, they were removed, they were made to adopt all of the American traditions, um, while not celebrating as many of the Indian traditions. Uh, also, it was harder to find community, but even if they did that, you know, it was always small scale and nothing uh, to, to major, anything to be proud of. And it was only much later when she was um, an adult and she started realizing and, you know, kind of trying to find her identity between both these narratives of her life, like the Indian aspect, as well as the American aspect. And she realized like she was lacking so much in knowing about her own Indian culture. And so she never fit, felt like she fit. She didn't fit in India. She didn't fit in the States. And this book is sort of written for that audience and for the audience like myself who were born and raised in India who never, we just don't see ourselves in books, especially in children's books, like a brown kid from India doing something cool and fantastic. You just don't really see that. You see more stories and, you know, we can touch upon that later, but more pain stories and struggle stories, which are, again are important. But in this book, I have a lot of Indian culture woven in. I mean, it's just seamless details that are in. It's not about Indian culture. Um, this isn't also a story about Rhea and just focusing on her Indianness because I feel like that also is something that happens, uh, especially when you are the minority in a different country. Uh, I grew up not thinking about my Indianness so much because I was surrounded by Indians, but I know so many of my cousins who live here that the Indianness is like such a big, like, you know, it sets them apart and it is othering. And so this book, throws in all of the, you know, my little homages to this vast Indian culture. So just little, you know, little things here and there that we do, we eat, our family dynamics, um, the way we dress, uh, or some of our superstitions, but just things that actually are very universal when you think about it to most cultures around the world, if not all. And kind of to show kids who haven't seen themselves in books or seen their culture represented in books to make them feel seen and also to those other kids who find kids from different cultures, you know, like they're coming from these exotic lands, less exotic because, you know, the world is a melting pot and, and our literature needs to reflect that. So with Rhea and the Blood of the Nectar, that's what I kind of tried to do. Introduce a story. There's a universal story with details about Indian culture and life. But, you know, like tipping my hat off to them, celebrating them, hoping kids will find pride in it and see themselves, but then also not be the only thing that defines them. Yeah, that's a great answer. I, I like that. The fact that, um, like you said, I, I love that you focus 
that your story focuses on the story itself, not necessarily where she comes from or trying to push that, you know, culture. It's just, she happens to be in it, but there's this adventure, this beautiful adventure that, you know, she's inviting you to join. So you could learn and, and you get involved in the story rather than trying to analyze the culture or break in, you know, it's just a companionship. It's a, it's a character there too, as well. So I, I like that. And I'm going to move to Maria because I like Maria's experience, uh, her journey that she was born in, in Argent, no, in Spain, right? And moved to Argentina and then migrated to the U.S. And just like me, did not speak any English at all. And just, Maria, your struggle to, to learn the language and all that, you, you portray that so beautifully in your books. And Love in English, I, I love that book. I read it probably three times just because I wanted to catch every detail in there. So can you expand on this, Maria, about the view of, of how educators and teachers could, uh, or librarians could support immigrant kids better? Yeah, I mean, I, I second what everyone else has said. And just to add something new, I think it's, um, it, it's also about almost leaving all our presuppositions at the door, right? Because if if I walk into a room, people make decisions about me, right? They they think they know something about my experience. Uh, you know, I'm I'm white, which has made my experience different from from other people. Um, and so, but then just by looking at me, you wouldn't be able to see my story written on me, right? So, uh, and I've had experiences where I've been in groups where people thought, oh, it's we're just among us, and they said something just awful that really did apply to me you know and but they they didn't see it on my face and so they thought they were it was a comfortable moment to say something like that and so I think it just it, it behooves us all as as humans and individuals to leave our presuppositions at the door but particularly for educators and librarians because you really cannot read a child's story you know on their face or or just by seeing some detail about them that that we think is is um is identifying. And so, and also, you know, the fact that any one family or any one child can, can, can really kind of run the gamut of experiences, right? Like I see this in my own life. I was undocumented. I was across the US-Mexico border uh, undocumented when I was eight. My parents had grown up in Argentina, but then there, there was this family background of their parents had grown up in Spain. So it was just this like, you know, kind of a complicated backstory. And then uh, we crossed the US-Mexico border. And so, you know, there was there was poverty and there was, you know, being undocumented and all of that fear of and insecurity. But then, you know, the, there have been different experiences in my life as well. I went to college and now I live kind of a, a, a comfortable middle-class life. And so in one lifetime, I've been on many parts of the journey. And so in families, you see that all the time where there's a parent who is undocumented, there's a parent who's a resident, there's a child who was born in the US. But, but like, for example, I was born outside the US, so I was undocumented. My brother was born in the US and he is a citizen. Uh, so, so anyone dealing with our family would have had to understand many nuances. And that's true for most of the, of the kids um, that have some kind of immigrant experience and those that don't, who need to be sensitive to that. So I think it's important to really kind of come to people just very much on an individual basis. Like, let me learn about you because you, and we all contain multitudes. So that I, I hope that's what people take away from my story. Oh, no, definitely. Yeah, I identify with that totally because my mom and I immigrated here, but we saw things differently. We still do. You know, she comes from a different generation and she sees, even though we're both immigrants, she sees things differently. And that's something that I wanted to portray too in, in uh, my book, Refugees of Petra Luna, even though it happened 100 years ago, there's different ways that a grandmother and a grandson or a grandchild, a mother and a child are going to see the world differently. And they see opportunities differently. And, and I like how Maria described that, that even within one household, you have all these aspects of uh, different statuses and different perspectives. So thank you, Maria. And we're going to go to Daniel now. Daniel, what's your, your perspective? You have a very unique, I love this group because we're all so unique in how we, we got to this country and how we got to our writings and in our journeys. So what's your, your thoughts? 
Absolutely. Well, for me, I grew up in Mexico. I grew up speaking Spanish basically my whole life. And I left Mexico when I was a teenager. And what I always say is that, you know, being a teenager is hard enough as it is. Um, you know, you're dealing with so many questions about your identity, about what you like, about how you view the world, about how the world views you. And I think that just being an immigrant or the child of immigrants just adds this whole other dimension to that struggle of being a teenager. And I think that for me, those years of asking myself all these questions are always just gonna stick with me. And they're always gonna be reflected in my work in one way or another. And that is the case with my debut novel, um, Indivisible, where the main character just asks himself how he fits into the world. And you know, whether he's Mexican, whether he's American, and his situation is different from mine, but you know, these questions are still there and and as you were saying what i love about this group is that we each come at you know this from our own unique perspectives and we we've all written books that are so you know unique in in the ways that we that we reflect our immigrant backgrounds and so i think that for schools and for librarians it's just important to understand that there's no one perspective on immigration or no one journey on immigration and that just bringing in so many different books that reflect this experience in their unique ways is just the best thing to do to um to make sure that every student feels seen and that every student gets to learn something from from this experience yeah i'm always I admire how how well you speak english and how <laughs> you know, i would have never suspected that you came here as a teenager it, it took me forever to learn i'm still learning english oh my goodness it's still so <laughs> difficult but all right we're going to move to the next question and we're going to start with um with payal this time so why does learning about these issues make everyone's life richer not just immigrant kids so when you you present books like yours what, what makes every kid, uh, kids like richer after reading your, your writing? You know, to begin with, like the, you know, just look down your street, right? It is, you will find people from different backgrounds, different nationalities, go to your grocery store, look around, you find people that look different from you. That is a reality. The world is getting closer and closer, you know, with internet and media and stuff like that. And books like ours are so important for kids that they represent in these books. But like you're saying, even I would say equally the kids, like the white kids or the kids who are not represented in these books because A, it really opens the door to a new perspective of life, life that is very much lived uh, around the world. You know, I always chuckle when people, uh, when I, you know, I say my book is uh, South Asian and, you know, they call it a minority. And in my head, I'm always chuckling because I come from a country of a billion people. And so we're quite safely a majority, I would say, but that just shows that we just haven't been uh, represented in books. So other people view us as minorities. And, you know, again, it just becomes very othering. Books like ours, open up those perspectives, blur those lines between, I am at different from you because of these things. In fact, what they do is they bring people together. It creates so much empathy. You learn to see the world from somebody else's point of view, from in somebody else's shoes. Uh, sure, you can go and you can, in, for, in my book, you can go on this adventure with these kids uh, and almost forget that they're Indian and then realize you're connecting with Rhea and you're feeling the things she's feeling. And it doesn't matter the color of your skin or the nation you come from versus if you read any of your books, uh, you, you empathize for those characters. You want to cry sometimes and you feel their pain. And it doesn't matter that you've never been undocumented or you've had to cross a border, you know? So, I mean, books, are one of the best teachers, right? Without like knocking it on your head to say, learn empathy and learn these, these different stories. And it's such a beautiful way to bring cultures together, to bring kids together and for kids in classrooms to look at their you know, neighbors in their classes and be able to understand some of their experiences and vice versa. I mean, I, they're just, there's so much books with different cultures and perspectives can bring to a classroom and to a, to a child's life. Yeah, and I, I agree with that about having almost a, a universal uh, theme in, in our books that any people could identify with. For instance, my, my book, Barefoot Dreams of Petra Luna, Petra Luna is a 12-year-old girl who's 
helping her grandmother and her younger siblings escape the Mexican Revolution. And their goal is to reach the safety of the US and cross that border so that they could be safe, so that their lives could be spared. But I don't consider this story unique to Petra or to my family because it's based on a family story or to Mexicans. You know, it, it's a universal story that transcends time, location. And there's so many people that have migrated to this country and who face oppression. And right now at the moment, not only in America, but they're you know migrating into Europe. So yeah, I love that universal theme that people could identify with, whether they live that experience or not, you know, enriches their lives just by learning it. And I'll, I'll go with uh, Daniel, because Daniel's story too, I, I love the way your main character, how protective he, he is of his sister. Of how, you know, despite, like you say, he's trying to find himself in the world, but he knows his position as a, an older brother. So what, what do you have to say about that? Absolutely. Well, as Pyle mentioned, I think that books have just this huge power to build empathy. And I love this idea that you know, kids who perhaps need, uh, you know, to see themselves reflected in media and who haven't always seen themselves reflected, reflected in media. Um, I love the idea of them having this opportunity to pick up a book and see, you know, little pieces of themselves or their, the questions that they ask themselves or of their families and their experiences in these stories. And I also really, really just think that any book, like literature has such power to teach us something new. And whatever book that we pick up is gonna teach us something different about the world, about um, people who may be similar or different from ourselves. And so I think that there's just huge value in, in reading diversely for that reason. That's great, yeah, I like that. And in, in, uh, in like Maria's books, both of your books, I, I think they come from different perspectives and they do enrich lives, you know, because, uh, I learned a lot from that first book too that you wrote just because uh, my mom has really fair skin and uh, she was treated differently you know than I would have or you know her siblings too because her siblings looked opposite you know really dark skin really dark hair so but that book really really touched me so how do you see about these books or are you writing enriching kids lives whether they're immigrants or not um, thank you. And, and by the way, I will not take the position of like, oh, it was hard to be lighter skinned than, than other people. I mean, like, for sure, that was a privilege that I had that I did nothing to earn. So I really want to own that. Um, and, uh, and it also speaks to, again, the specificity of experience. Like I had some privileges in that I, I walked through the world, you know, undisturbed in that way. Uh, you know, I was still really afraid of cops, but the cops mostly left me alone. Um, so, but yeah, you know, this is slightly not an answer and I'll, I'll meander back to an answer to your question, but I, for some reason recently, I've been thinking a lot about how we all left, we as humanity all left in a small band of humans that all left Africa, you know, together and then kind of fanned out all over the world. And so in a very real way, we're all family. You know, even I, I'm not up on my anthropology, let's say 100,000 years ago, whenever that was. Um, and then so in a way, it's so false that we that we create these separations between each other. Right. It's like I'm from here and you're from there. Like, no, we're actually all family. We all came from the same place. And so in some ways, what's happening now with, you know, airline travel and, and, you know, all of the upheavals in our modern world is like, we're coming back together and it's painful, right? It's difficult. It's like, there's push and pull and there's movement. It's like, no, I belong here, but you don't belong here. And like, there's a line that we've drawn on this ground and whatever, but like at the end of the, of the day, this is all one world and we're all one people. And, and so to kind of get back to the answer to your story, it's like my attempt is to show that, you know, like we are all one people, we all have very unique and specific experiences, but in the end, it's all of us kind of sharing this world. If that's an answer, I'm not sure if it is. But. No, no, that's great. I, and I like that because uh, it's funny that you mentioned about being afraid of, of cops because that's the way my mom was, you know, every time we saw La Migra, you know, <laughs> we'd kind of like just stay quiet and stay put. But uh, oh, every time there was a, a knock on the door of my house, it was like, don't move, you know, like maybe it's finally La Migra. <laughs> <laughs> so to this day I do not love the doorbell not ringing <laughs> the, the mailman will ring the doorbell and be like what is that you know, so. yeah no that's no working, uh, 
<laughs> what I feel. You know, my mom and my mom too. She'd walk into a store and they thought she would speak English when they saw her. And when they found out she didn't, it was probably worse. The, the rejection, like, wait a minute, you look like this and you don't speak English, you know. So my mom felt that that uh that prejudice too for you know the fact that she was light skinned, yeah, she was Mexican and anyways, but you're right. We're, no, we're all one people, and that's one thing I think our, our stories aim to do to connect us all connect that humanity and let us know that we're not that different you know that we're all so similar more similar than what we think we are and it's that thing that we have to grasp that the similarities and and strive for that because yeah right now we're so separated and we gotta at least teach those younger readers that young generation that no look at us you know we're we're the same we're the same people so i, I love how our writings do that and i'm gonna go with margie what's your your input about that, Margie, as an educator and librarian. I'm going to feel the same way. Like every, Books are magic. I'm a librarian, and I'm a reading teacher, an ex-reading teacher. So for me, books are magic. And books are everything. That, that's what I use for ever since I was a child. Like books just always. And I've always felt that if you don't understand something, if you don't know something, you need to learn about it. And you learn about it through books. So you pick up a book from somebody with it from another culture and you learn about that culture you learn about that people if you you need to be able you know give yourself the chance to walk in somebody else's shoes through a book like I Maria's book I remember her first book and I always tell her you know because I read that book back when it came out I don't remember how long ago it was a long time ago and I didn't know her at the time and I remember when I was even getting in this group with her I was like oh my god like Maria Andrew because I loved that book so much I remember reading that book and thinking like, wow, you know, she, and how she, she was like, she said light skinned and she kind of was hiding out in the, out in the world. Like she was hiding, but out loud. I don't know how to explain it. It was just so, it, that book really made a big impact on me too. So that's what I think books do for everybody. So everybody needs books of all, like, that's why we need diverse books in schools and in classrooms and in libraries, because a student who doesn't understand something, they need to take a book and they will understand it. Books do make us more empathetic. Books do make us better people. So I think all of our books here um, are very, very unique and very important because just I've read them all and just reading them all. And as somebody who is like, my, I, you know, I'm a, I, I try to read books as a just as like a person. And then I tried to read them as like my professional educator self too, you know, like what I can recommend to teachers and students and then just try to internalize all of it for myself. And these books that we have in the, just this little group alone are such great resources for other people to understand other cultures and other people and just learn that we are all the same. And we have the, we all hurt the same, we cry the same, we bleed the same everything is and books do that books are magic yeah I, I agree with that and and for instance like I said my book's a historical fiction that gives a, an insight to the Mexican revolution back in 1913 and you see the suffering of the people that they have to work in the haciendas or forced to work there they can't escape because they're indebted to the hacienda store and uh, if they do try to escape, you know, the, the rurales will catch them. And, and um, so that's its own history. But I also saw a similar history when I read the book by Avi, the, the Crispin, the novel. And it's about a British, you know, a young man, a young boy in England back in the 1300s, which you think it's a different part of the world, different time, centuries long before my book, yet there's a parallel with the stories so that's a beauty, like uh, you were saying, Margie, there's magic there because you, you find all these parallels and you're like, oh my goodness, you know, this happened over here, but that happened too. And this is how they relate. And characters too, you find that similarity. And like Maria said, that's how uh, we're all connected. We come from the same place and, and our stories bring this magic that connects us all. So I, I, uh, I appreciate that, that answer, that perspective. And I have this question here about, your writing. So what would you like for your personal books? What would you like for educators to know about the immigrant experience through your through your writing? So I'm going to start with Daniel. Yeah, so I 
When I started writing this book, um, you know, I had known for a long time that I wanted to write about an immigrant family, um, you know, my family being immigrants. And I wanted to write about a immigrant main character um, or, you know, who came from a family of immigrants. And, you know, I eventually came around to telling this specific story, which is about a Mexican teenager whose parents are undocumented immigrants and who are detained by immigration authorities. And I, I think that I started writing it because I kept seeing, you know, just all around me on the news um, in conversations that I heard in my environment, just the fact that we were talking about immigration in such a cold way. And that is something that to this day kind of like is something I pay attention to and something that, that I feel very deeply, just the fact that we talk about immigration as purely, you know, politics, as purely like something legal, something to analyze. And we forget that, immigration is ultimately a human issue and not a political one um, at its core, I would say. And so I wanted to write a story that felt very human and that talked about immigration from the perspective of a family and from you know, the perspective of the real life consequences that immigration policy has. And so if there is one thing that I hope people will, will take um, from this story is exactly that, just um, to think about immigration from a more human perspective and to realize that when we talk about immigrants we are talking about families about people with hopes with dreams with you know with every single hope for the future and for their children's future yeah no i like that too because in my story uh it was the same issue there there are some people that were hoping for more political statements in the mm -hmm. book but I felt that that wasn't the story. It wasn't going to be true to the story. And I wanted to tell Petra's story. She's a 12 year old and she's telling her story from her perspective, which a kid at 12 who's escaping war is not going to think about politics, you know, her mind survival. And that's what I wanted to stick to with in the story. So, you know, I'm sorry if I didn't put politics in it. I wanted to tell the story. So that was my coming with this story. I wanted just to stick to the story say what was in her mind and see what, so people could see the world that was around her and what caused those conditions, you know, in her view and what caused her to try to survive that. So how about for you, Payal, how do you see your, your writing uh, doing this perspective or, or, um, uh, or creating this perspective for students on the immigration? Yeah. Um, so mine is, you know, mine is not an immigrant story, right? Because it's, she's, Indian and she lives in India, but it's a story that can um, be that a kid who is an immigrant can very much relate to because again, they can see themselves in the book and they see these aspects um, of their culture represented in there. But when I sat to write this story, my, um, my motivation to write it was to write a story that was joyful to my experience, to my to my to the immigrant experience of of South Asians and for South Asians uh, around the world, and this was important to me because in the last ten years, I think we have started to see books, children's books specifically, have more representation on the South Asian um, Indian front. But again, like I mentioned before, a lot of those stories were about the immigration experience, or were war stories, or poverty stories, and these stories. Um, or like, again, historical fiction, uh, which is very similar to kind of your story, uh, Alda, where we had the partition of Pakistan and India, and so many families were torn apart, had to move, had to uproot their lives and move into another country. Um, so much displacement. And, you know, we have, that's very, very rife uh, in our cultural uh, heritage and history. But we just fit, almost did not see any stories that had these kids or uh, from South Asia that showcase this different, happy, joyful side of their family or their life. Um, not to say that they had no pain or nothing, but they just read of, led a regular life where they were struggling with, you know, coming of age and uh, figuring themselves out and all of the regular stuff that kids face. I just never saw that. And then I, and on top of that, I never saw an Indian kid be the hero of the story or have magic, be the one who saves the world or be the one who rides the dragon or be the one, you know, that people don't do. Never. 
And uh, I remember the very first time I saw myself in a book was uh, in Harry Potter when, she, when J.K. Rowling had uh, Padma and Parvati Patel put in. And I remember I read these books as an adult. Um, I was easily, I think, oh yeah, I, rem I was uh, 20, 2021 when I read uh, the book that had Parvati and Padma Patel. And I was ecstatic. I remember called my friends up, oh my God, did you read that? And that was it. That was it. And that was not great representation. <laughs> when you look back at it today, it is not. I mean, but it was there and it was so tiny and it made such a difference. Um, and I had not realized that. So anyway, just to just to you know quickly wrap it up to say that uh, so this book is my is just to show a different perspective, which is very important for educators as well. That when you look at a kid who is an immigrant kid uh, or comes from an immigrant family, do not only supply them with stories that you know talk about uh, pain or struggle. That they are also can be shown to you know have fun and do cool things and uh, be empowered in that way as well. Like it's just all the stories are important and so as a as a teacher and a librarian I hope that they do that and also if there's a kid who's a white kid who's coming and asking for recommendations for books then if they like fantasy do not be like oh but this is a South Asian fantasy so we'll skip that no our stories like Daniel said are human stories so if someone wants a story that is moving that speaks to the human experience and they're white or they're brown like me Daniel's story, Alda's story, Margie's stories, Maria's story, all of them apply. If I want to read an anthology, it doesn't, oh, Margie's story is, you know, books apply. That's the, that's, that's what I hope that this book also does to show the commonality and that um, show a different perspective to the, um, to South Asian representation. And, and it does, you're right. Like I mentioned the book, uh, Crispin earlier, how much I enjoyed that book, despite that I'm not English and I, no way lived in medieval England, you know, but I identified with that character because I knew my ancestors had gone through the same uh, prejudices back in Mexico and I drew those parallels. So the same thing when they read your book, Paya, when kids read Rhea, yeah, they could identify with that and say, you know, like, I've always wanted to, especially girls, you know, when they see that cover and they're like, oh my goodness, if I could have superpowers like her, you know, so I like that. That's awesome. And now, just like Paya, you say you were born here, Margie, I mean, you, yeah, you weren't born here, but Margie, you were um, born here. And your perspective is different because you have anthology. So you have a lot of perspectives. There are people who were born in Texas or who were not. So how do you view this in your editing of this anthology? My my reasoning behind, I like I said, I've already said that I was a teacher. I remember my first year teaching, um, they just throw you, like you learn, you go to teaching school or whatever, and they don't teach you how to teach. You throw you in a classroom and you're like, oh my God, what do I do here? And I remember thinking like, what do I do here? And with these kids all looking at me, so I was like, I'm going to get a book. I'm going to read a book. So we read The Outsiders, which is one of my favorite books in the whole world. Because The Outsiders is a universal book. There's everything, all the themes in it, they're just perfect. And then after that, I thought to myself, my kids were the ones asking me, like, ooh, Miss, wouldn't it be cool if, like, The Outsiders were Mexican? Or, like, because, and, and I was thinking to myself, you know, yeah, it would be cool if The Outsiders were Mexican. But then I was like, th there was no story about Mexican kids, right? I had one book by a professor of mine, Dr. Saldana, who's in my book. He's, he wrote a poem for a book. He had, a, he had a, one of the first people from the valley to have like a major publishing contract with somebody so I was like we're going to read Dr. Saldana's book so we read it the kids loved it because it was all about the valley it was all they, they knew the places they were like they they went to La Plaza Mall like it was just so perfect and I was like I need more they wanted more stories like that I was looking there was no stories I could not find stories by Mexican Americans for, for my students to read so Fast forward 16 years, and I found some, and I got better, but, at, you know, I did, there were, like, Viola Canales, Sandra Cisneros, so we, we found some, but there just wasn't a lot, so fast forward 16 years, and I decide, they're talking, you know, saying ugly things about Mexicans in the media, saying, you know, Mexican-Americans, and Mexicans are rapists, and bad hombres, and just all these terrible things, and I was getting so frustrated, and I thought, like, I need to do something to, because we're not all bad people, everybody has bad people, every, you know, there's good and bad everywhere, so, and it just doesn't happen to us, you know? So I um, I wanted a book, an anthology of short stories, poems, essays, something that was gonna represent 
try to represent our culture in a good light, you know, like, and how it feels to grow up as other when we're not other because we are American. So that was so, that, that was also very kind of, and I went out and I asked some of the best people that I knew that were Mexican American writers and they, you know, some said yes, some said no. And fast forward a couple of years and we have our anthology and it's, the stories are all different. It's a diverse group of contributors from seasoned writers to brand new writers, from happy stories to, and it's just everything mixed in between because that's life. You know, we have our emotions are everywhere all the time. We have good times, bad times, you know, trying times. So I feel that's what, that's what I wanted to do with this book. And I wanted it to represent us as best as it could so everybody can read it. Not only, I wanted our, our young people to be proud to be Mexican American, to see themselves in these stories and be proud that they are Mexican American, not be ashamed. And I wanted other people who aren't Mexican American to read this book and to see us and think like they are just as beautiful as, you know, the, the stories that, you know, because we are a beautiful culture. We're all, every culture is beautiful. We all have beauty. And I wanted that to shine in the anthology. So I'm, and, and we're really lucky because it's, it's been picked up in a, it's in two reading, Texas reading lists. That means that, you know, more schools are going to pick it up and it's part of the read across America for the school year. It's the book of the month for June. So I'm really excited about that. Cause that's like from sea to shining sea. So hopefully every, you know, that kids, more kids can read about our culture and see how we're all and all the same and all, all beautiful. So that's what I'm hoping. I, I, I'm hoping that, that we did that for educators because as an educator, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to give stories for teachers to use in their classrooms for, and, and it is being used in classrooms. Like I have uh, professors in Mexican American studies classes that have contacted me and I've, I've gone virtual with their students because they're reading it in their Mexican American studies classes and their children and adolescent literature classes in universities. And I'm just like over the moon because I'm a, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm also a professional student. So I love that my, that our book was on a syllabus that made, like, I was like on cloud nine that we were on a syllabus. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's great. Hope that these that's books awesome. do. <laughs> yeah, I see your book everywhere. So yeah, congratulations. That's awesome. I'm, I'm glad that you were able to, like you said, you were kind of doubting it, you know, at, at times you thought that that's far-fetched, but no, it happened. Here it is. So thank you. And Maria, right, you haven't gone through this question yet. Just want to make sure what's your, your perspective in your writing, how, how you come across uh, to talk about the what's unique in your views and your books about the immigrant experience. Yeah, so what's interesting is I've, I've, as many writers are, I began as a reader, and I can't say that I specifically sought out immigrant stories. And I, and when I began writing, I can't say that I, I specifically set out to write immigrant stories. But it, it's so true that when you want to put something down on a page, it's like there are things, there are themes that keep coming up for you, right? And like for me the things that have happened in my life and the things that I see in the world around me just kept coming up. And so my first book was more along the lines, it, it was semi-autobiographical and what it was like to be undocumented. And so for Love in English, um, I want, oh, my blur is going to make the cover not oh, show. There you, there you go. go. <laughs> uh, the, the uh, you know, I didn't, I wanted to revisit I wanted to revisit the immigrant experience, but not necessarily in, in the same way. So this the, my first protagonist had grown up here, but had been undocumented. Um, this is a lighter book. So I wanted it to be, I didn't want it to be immigration. Uh, I wanted her immigration status to not be an issue. So she comes over with papers, but she's 16 and she doesn't speak English. Um, and that's an experience that I had uh, coming over and not speaking English. And I have memories of sitting, I was a little younger, I was in the third grade but sitting in a classroom, kind of like that experience that you were describing, Margie, but you know, I was like living it for real, sitting in a class, teacher up at the front of the room, like wah, 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 wah. <laughs> you know, the Charlie Brown, like what is going on? <laughs> and I remember having this feeling at eight years old of like, maybe this is just my life now. Like maybe I never understand what happens in a class again, because there was, it was a small parochial school. There was no ESL. There was just sitting there and hoping, like, I remember being super excited. This is something that I put in the book. I was super excited when math came around. Cause I was like, Oh, 
numbers they're the same like fantastic I get I, I got this like and that was you know and I'm not mathematical at all but that was like a little purchase into I think maybe I am going to figure this out and and I did I was lucky that way um so in in this book I wanted to there's so many facets to being new in a place and and in this one I really le leaned into this idea of like uh what is language what does it mean like, what does it mean when we can't communicate in the ways that we want to and we're cut off in that way? Like, how how does the language that we speak kind of define who we are and how does that change when you go to a place where you don't speak it? And um, so these are issues I've been grappling with for my whole life. And clearly now I've realized I will continue to grapple with. So I just wanted to kind of put that into the book. Yeah, and that's such a universal theme too of, of uh, immigrants because we have so many people like Margie was talking about the Korean, you know, being spoken in the class and so many languages that we have here. So I'm sure a lot of kids that could identify with that experience as well with the language barrier. And for my story, Barefoot Dreams of Petra Luna, it's a, it's a family story. It's inspired by a family story. And a lot of it is fictionalized, but I wanted to show that perspective of me doing the research for a family story and encourage young readers to do the same, to go and seek their own family stories, because there, there are so many histories that we have that, again, connects us all, but we got to dig for these gems, and, and this is the, the history that's going to provide strength, because it's a lot of uh, the struggles and, and fears and joys that our ancestors lived through, and when they pass these stories to us, you know, we carry that same light, that same uh, joy and bravery. So it's stories that we have to find and seek. And not only that, but we have to learn how to share them and, and be, be happy to share them just so that, you know, we could learn more about ourselves and the rest of the world. So that was my, my perspective. So right now, are you guys ready for the, the lightning round uh, of questions? <laughs> This is something we do. We, we enjoy doing this. So we're going to go with, I'm going to start with uh, Maria again. So how did the title of your book come about or how did it change? Oh, I don't know how lightning I can make this answer. Yeah, I know. So right? it I originally... think that's a lightning round one. <laughs> Uh, short answer is it changed. It was it was it was sold on the contract. It says just English, right? Um, and then eh, you know, then they were. I think they were afraid that was going to sound like a textbook or something. So they were like, oh, well. <laughs> so we we went back and forth and we played around with it. And really, the two main themes in the book are love and English. So it is called Love in English. So there you go. Beautiful. I love it. As lightning as I can get it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. I, I, it doesn't make sense why it's lightning, but that's all right. Take your time. <laughs> so we'll go with Payao next. Yeah, I'm going to have to also really like shorten this. So my book <laughs> was called Amaranthia, which um, was the name of the fantastical realm in my story, which is a fantasy adventure. I'm so bad with titles, and that was the only thing I could think of. So it was called Amaranthia Sent Off. My editor then calls me and during our first round of developmental edits, she's like, have you ever Googled all of the stuff that you made up, you know, the invented words and the name of your realm? And I was like, no. She's like, pro tip, especially in, when you're writing fantasy, uh, you should always Google the stuff that you put in. You don't realize how much of it, you know, is inspired and you don't realize how much is percolated in your head and it, it sort of comes out as inventive in your head and original. Turns out Amaranthia is the, I think, name of a character from World of Warcraft, which obviously is, you know, slightly more popular than my book. So if it's like, so she's like, if anyone put in that name, that will pop up, like your book would never come up. So we then uh had to scrap it and I had to come up with a whole not only new title but also new name for this realm and I would say that the title was such an easier like fix with Rhea and the blood of the nectar nectar is the the magic system in my land and it's to do with blood and Rhea is the main character so that was great but I have to say that it took me a while to get used to the land the new land's name because I was so attached to Amaranth here but all's well in the end um, <laughs> How about for you, Margie? I wanted it at first. I wanted it to be Love Beyond Borders, but then one of my friends was like, um, "Not my friend. My my editor was like, it might sound like a love, like a like a romance." <laughs> I was like, <laughs> "I love romance. Like that's all." And they were like, "No." So then I just thought Living Beyond Borders. So 
It is. And then I just kind of, I didn't even know it was going to be the title. That's just kind of like what I pitched it at. And then they're like, that's a title. And that's like, they didn't even, there wasn't even a chance to change it. They're like, that's what it is. Okay. And so and I, I love the way it sounds in Spanish too. The translate it, that it sounds beautiful. Más allá de la frontera, that's <laughs> it's beautiful. So, how about for you, Daniel? Well, my title also changed. It was originally the Unknown Life of Matt Garcia, but as often happens, um, marketing departments and publishers want to do their own thing, and so we considered a million different options, like so many different titles and none of them felt right until my agent emailed me one afternoon saying indivisible, like there's something about this word. And it wasn't even in the manuscript, um, but uh, we realized like, yeah, it was a word that really described my characters and just uh, the, the family that I'm writing about because despite their circumstances and despite you know so many difficulties that they go through they manage to remain you know emotionally close and they are truly like indivisible and so I wrote a scene toward the end of the book to fit in this title and I ultimately loved it. No it's a beautiful name I love it I love the because you also see those lines and stripes too you know so it, it does blend in with the title I love that and, and for me Barefoot Dreams of Petra Luna uh it was an original name of the manuscript and I crossed my fingers hoping that they wouldn't change it because it was so long, but I didn't say anything. Nobody said anything and it got put on the book. So I was really excited, but uh, barefoot dreams comes from the fact that kids were barefoot back then, you know, shoes were a luxury during the times of my grandmother and my great grandmother. So I wanted to put the word barefoot there, though it's got more symbolism. If you read the book, you know, I don't want to go into details here, what, what it stands for. And the dreams were uh, just like Petra Luna, my great grandmother and my grandmother both were illiterate and their dream was to learn how to read and read and write. So my great grandmother took a lot of effort but she was able to do it on her own because she couldn't go to school, she had to work. But by the age of 12, some way, somehow she broke the code and she learned how to read on her own. So, but the word dreams, you know, stuck with me and barefoot. So I put them together and we have barefoot dreams now. <laughs> So, all right, the next question should be lightning, okay? <laughs> if not, I'll be in trouble, let's see. Okay, we'll start with Maria. What is the book that most inspired you to write or your favorite book as a kid? Uh, this changes every time we do this panel because <laughs> there's so many of them, I can't pick one. <laughs> um, but I think in terms of, if I had to trace my writing YA back to a book, not loving books in general, but writing YA in particular, it would be Judy Bloom's Tiger Eyes. Um, I read that as a teenager and it blew my mind um, because I loved that that character, that it, it's, a, it's a girl, it's kind of a, a pretty heavy book. It's a girl whose father's murdered and then they move from New Jersey. Well, first of all, I live in New Jersey and the idea that a book, that someone in a book could be from New Jersey was amazing. Um, so that kind of rep for sure. And then they moved to New Mexico and, and so the, and most of the action of the book uh, takes place there, but she was angry and she just like acted out and, and, and wasn't always like good and sweet. Like she, she didn't like what had happened to her and she was just like railing, you know, internally against it. And there, there felt like such freedom, particularly for girls. Like you don't get to see girls don't get to be angry in books and in, and in movies. And, and I was angry a lot. Like I didn't love what was going on in my life. And, and there was such power to it. Um, and, and so I really thought a lot about that permission particularly when I wrote my first book, permission for a character to just not always be perfect and sometimes just be, you know, like sometimes if you're in a bad situation, you're not at your most, most chipper self and you make mistakes and you say the wrong thing. And um, so I trace it back, I think to, I mean, what Judy Bloom did so masterfully in that book mm. and in so many others, of course. Yeah, I know that's a great book. How about for you, Daniel? Well, for me, I think it also changes um, every time that we talk about this, but uh, Jodi Picoult's work has always been just so influential um, because I find that she's able to take difficult topics and talk about challenging things in such an accessible way and in such a human way. And I must have been 15 years old when I read my first Jodi Picoult uh, novel, uh, 19 Minutes, and it just blew my mind. And so that is definitely something that I try to do in my own work, um, just talk about 
things that may be tough in, a, in an accessible way. And in fact, as you guys know, uh, Jody ended up reading in the visible and she provided an endorsement for it, which was just one of the most exciting moments in, in my publishing journey. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I remember seeing that. My eyes were like, oh, <laughs> that's great. Now, how about for you, Margie? The first book I remember reading as a child, and I it was probably when I was, before I could read, my mother read it, you know, it's where the wild things are. This is my favorite book in the whole world. I just, I think it's a, I love Max. I think I was Max. I think I saw myself in Max. And my son, my little, my, my little Mateo, he's eight. He's Max. I just, it was one, it's, I love this book. Everything about it was perfect. And the, the, the drawings, the imagination. And I remember this book made me love books at three years old. So mm. this is my favorite book in the world. <laughs> Good. And Payal, how about your book? Mine was uh, Anne of Green Gables by Ellen Montgomery. I was about 11, I think, when I first read um, Anne. And I just fell in love with reading with I fell in love with books I think that was the book that did it for me and very much like what Maria said I was just so amazed to have read this book because up until then I read books by Enid Lytton which is she's such a prolific author in the UK and she writes children's books just these great adventure mystery stories the girls were always very prim and proper and you know the boys were doing the rugged things but the girls would go with them but they always conformed to quote unquote what girls should be like but Anne, like, gave this, you know, gave me the permission to write a character like Anne who's brash and tomboyish and flies off the handle and snaps at a boy if he says something that, you know, this is her off and like she doesn't hold back. Um, and, 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 and yet be such a great, wonderful character and, you know, be big of heart. And like, it's not that you have to be one or the other if you're not, you know, prim and then you're not then you're not good kind of a thing and I love that because I was like all of us were like that I think there's no uh even the primest of girl has her off days right and so I just uh I love that and and kind of you know to to the topic of our panel uh, I grew up never reading a book like children's books so never seeing myself in a book but I fell in love with reading I am here as a author today um, love, fell in love with language uh, of, you know, I, again, from India, I speak four lang three native languages, Hindi, Marathi, Gujarati, Gujarati, Gujarati is my native language, and then there's a national language and state language, and yet here I am writing a book in English, and so, and I only grew up on reading about white characters and white countries and white settings, and yet I connected to all those stories, and they're so dear to my heart, um, so, you know, that's what our books, our books in this panel can be for somebody else, white or not white, Indian or not Indian, Mexican or not Mexican. Um, I recently read A Wish in the Dark by um, Christina Sundervan and, I, and I, I relate to that book so much, even though it was set in East Asia and it's different from my experience, you know? So just goes to say books are magic. Um, and it was Anne who got me into reading. Oh, now for me, my answer doesn't change. So I probably bore you guys because you know my answer. Uh, it's I was a reluctant reader because uh, of my love hate relationship with English. And I was 16 when I read my first book from cover to cover, and that was Catcher in the Rye. And it was just by chance because I found that a tattered copy of it in the bus. I was running home from work. And I remember opening that book, uh, I was exhausted, but I read that first page and I was just captured. Uh, Salinger, the way he described the scene, the setting, the characters, emotions, and I was that, I was holding myself. And I'm, I was a 16 year old Mexican living in the South Side, San Antonio, poor as can be, but I felt that I was holding. I felt I was that yuppie kid living in New England, in the Northeast, you know, and having all that, those same, uh, dilemmas about who you are, how do you fit in the world? And I thought I was just blown away. I couldn't put the book down. And ever since that put that seed in me about storytelling and about writing. So it took a while for me to get that confidence, but that's the book that, that I still hold dear uh, to this moment, to this time. But um, so we're going to go with the last question, which this one really should be a lightning round. one. <laughs> but after the question, after we're done answering it, I want you to Grab your book and show it to the screen and um, tell us about how to best uh, 
get a hold of you, uh, social media handles or your website. And what's next for you, please, if you could let, let us know that. So we're going to go with this lightning round question. If you're going to be a star in a Broadway show, what character would you play and why? I like this question a lot. So we'll go with Maria. I love this question. Um, I want to be Velma Kelly in Chicago. <laughs> I want to sing all that jazz. <laughs> I can't sing, so I won't subject anyone to that, but that's who I'd be. <laughs> I love that. I love it. Yeah, she beat me to it. That was my my first <laughs> original one. But <laughs> okay, how about for you, Kaya? I would be, I don't know her name, but I think it was Sky, but um, from Mama Mia. I mean, <laughs> pandemic and all, take me to Greece. Let me sing my ABBA songs. I mean, who wants not to love? So that's what I would want to do right now. Oh, yeah. Were those bell bottom? Uh, <laughs> yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> How about for you, Daniel? Well, I've seen Wicked about eight times. I'm absolutely obsessed with it. So I would say any character from Wicked. Wicked. Oh, my goodness. I haven't seen that yet. I, I have to see I that. I love it. <laughs> How about for you, Margie? I want to be Christine from Phantom of the Opera because oh, I love yeah. Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> yeah. I want to be that girl everybody wants. So. One the of the most romantic ones, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and for me, I, I always, I can't change. It's Evita. I love Evita. I just, I, I love the whole, uh, I just identify with that character. The fact that she comes from the from the bottom, you know, small town in nowhere, Argentina, and she's trying to struggle and trying to make it. And I love the lines of the song, you know, uh, give me credit, I'll find ways to, you know, pay it. So, you know, you're always struggling, you're always hustling. So I love that character uh, for those reasons. So, all right, so we're gonna start with Maria again. If you could show us your book and tell us how to reach you and uh, what's next for you. Let's see how much of the blur I can. Oh, there we go. Oh, look at that. I, and I'm particularly happy about showing this to you because this is the paperback, which you cannot get until February 2nd, but I have a little sneak peek copy. So I'm super excited about that. Um, that's Love in English. Uh, the questions were what's next and where, where you can find me. Okay. So really I'm sort of ish on Instagram is the best way to find me, but the best, best way to find me is to go on my website, mariaeandrew.com and sign up for my newsletter because I do giveaways and fun stuff. And I actually have this awesome intern who, who has been putting together a much better newsletter than I can put together for myself. So um, please check that out. And what's next is I am working on the follow-up to Love in English, not the same characters, new characters, but you know some of the same themes. So I'm super excited about that. Cannot wait to share that with everybody. Yeah, I can't wait either. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, Payal. Um, so Rhea and the Blood of the Nectar is the first of a trilogy. And so I'm currently working on the sequel, which is currently scheduled to come out in 2023. Uh, you can find me on, uh, I'm most active on Instagram at file though she offer. Uh, I'm also very active on Twitter at file D writes. I also do a ton of giveaways and, um, yeah, just post a lot of writing and fun content and, uh, Best way to reach me is also my website, bialdoshioffer.com. Awesome. All right, Daniel. Yeah, so the best way to reach me, I would say, is my website, danielailman.com. And I'm also very active on Instagram, Dan Ailman. And I turned in um, my hopefully final round of revisions for book two this week. So it will hopefully come out in early 2023. Yeah, that's awesome. Oh, my goodness. All right, Margie. My anthology is Living Beyond Borders, Growing Up Mexican in America. I'm most active on Instagram at Margie's Must Reads. And so I'm working on a ton of things right now. So hopefully we'll see where that goes right now. No, I can't wait to hear about it. <laughs> now, I, I don't have my book. It's in the closet, but I know if I run and get it, I'm going to trip and it's going to be a disaster. So uh, I'm just going to show you a postcard of it here. And it's Barefoot Dreams of Petra Luna. And uh, I have a, a follow-up that follows Petra Luna. Uh, it's a second book. It's called The Other Side of the River. And it follows Petra Luna to a refugee camp, which is the same refugee camp that my great grandmother was in. And then on to San Antonio where 30,000 refugees ended up. And so that'll be out in September. Uh, and you can find me uh, on Instagram. I'm not as active as I'd like, but I'm getting there. I'm working my way. I'm learning from these masters here uh, that, that you know set the example for me. And uh, but 
you can find me on my website, aldapdops.com. I have a quarterly newsletter too. Then I'm gonna start doing giveaways and I give recommendations and writing tips. So yeah, feel free to reach me there with questions and you can uh, have access to all of us too because we're all happy to answer questions. And if you wanna share your, your perspective of immigrant experiences or if you have questions for us, Feel free to reach us anytime. We're, we're all very friendly. We don't bite. So <laughs> I haven't met some people in person, but I'm sure they don't bite. So it's all good. So thank you so much for joining us. And I want to thank Get Lit for having us uh, here. And, and it's just phenomenal that, you know, we get to reach readers in the Northwest. I want to thank uh, uh, Kate Peterson and Luke Leinberger and Brittany Jennings. Thank you so much. And y'all have a wonderful day. Y'all take care. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alda, Maria, Margie, Daniel, and Pyle. This was such a fun event and also a really important conversation. Um, so we're really lucky to have you all here and have you share your unique perspectives. Um, I love that it was said today that books are magic and that books are our best teachers. We definitely believe that here at Get Lit. And so I think this will be really helpful for our audiences, especially writers, teachers, and librarians. Um, so thank you again for being part of our festival. And thank you, Alda, for moderating moderating the conversation and for submitting the idea for today's event. And thanks also to our intern, Brittany, for being here with us behind the scenes. And to everyone at home, I hope that you will join us for more festival events, both in person and here in the virtual sphere. Please visit our website, getlitfestival.org, for our full schedule and for more information about all of our authors, including today's talented panelists. So thank you again for joining us. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you for having us.